Welcome to uh, another episode of Scott Ritter Show. Um, when we reflect on what's going on this week uh, in in regards to Ukraine, there are several uh, topics of interest. Um, leading the list maybe is perhaps um, the 101st Airborne Division's return to Europe. It's been nearly 80 years since the Screaming Eagles have set foot on European soil. Uh, they were famous for their participation in the Normandy assault, uh, the defense of Bastogne, uh, in the conquest, uh, the final conquest of, of Nazi Germany. But now they're back in Romania. And they've made headlines lately when the assistant division commander, accompanied by uh, a brigade commander, uh, did a helicopter tour with a um, CBS News correspondent flying along the Romanian-Ukrainian border. And uh, the assistant division commander made a comment to the effect that they're ready. They're ready to fight Russia if Russia decides to invade NATO. And if the situation requires, they're ready to go to Ukraine. Now, this, this statement was immediately contradicted by uh, the White House and the Department of Defense, who reiterated the longstanding uh, U.S. policy that there will be no American boots on the grounds in Ukraine. We are not going to be sending troops there under any conditions. But uh, to have uh, 4,700 American troops deployed that close to a zone where Russia is actively engaged in combat uh, has many people thinking, is America really going to do something? Let's be rest assured that the second uh, combat brigade of the 101st Airborne Division is not going to be invading Ukraine anytime soon. I have nothing against the men and women who serve in this unit. They're all honorable people. They're well-trained, but they're not the proper unit for this kind of combat. The 101st Airborne Division uh, performed admirably in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in low-intensity con uh, combat situations, or in situations where they had a permissive environment for the operation of the helicopters that give them their famous air mobility. Anybody who thinks that Ukraine would be a permissive air defense environment doesn't understand modern war, doesn't understand the capabilities of the Russian Federation in this regard. Moreover, even if they made it on the ground, it's a light infantry division. They don't have tanks. They don't have armored fighting vehicles. They have one battalion of towed artillery. That's 18 guns to take on Russia's thousands. It's not that I'm encouraging or discouraging or, or just being disparaging of the potential of American combat uh, with Russian counterparts in Ukraine. What I'm trying to tell you is no rational military leader would ever order the second brigade to enter Ukraine for the purpose of closing with and engaging the Russian Federation by themselves. So this is a unit that's making a presence. It's a unit there to deter. It's a unit there to bolster the morale of the Romanian army. But it's not a unit that's prepared to enter Ukraine. And it's not an indication that the United States is even considering going into Ukraine to engage Russia. So I think people can calm down on that regard. The second thing is um, the dirty bomb. It's, uh, it's, it's achieved headlines lately. Uh, what is a dirty bomb? It's basically high explosive with um, radiological, radioactive material attached to it. Uh, it would blow up and very spread the uh, material around, contaminate the area, causing casualties uh, among anybody who arrived. The Russian Federation has made uh, headlines. Um, uh, Marshal Shoigu, Sergei Shoigu, the defense minister of Russia, has a uh, reached out and, uh, and, and contacted his counterparts in the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Turkey, and elsewhere, and uh, warning them that Russia has intelligence, that Ukraine is preparing a so-called dirty bomb, a, a, a radiation dispersal system um, that would be used uh, in an effort to create a false flag. Uh, that is to create an incident that Ukraine would say the Russians did it. The Russians attacked us with a nuclear device in the hopes that NATO and the United States 
would respond in support of Ukraine. Um, I can say this. Uh, I don't believe that Sergei Shoigu would pick up a phone and call his counterparts in the West for a simple propaganda exercise to spread disinformation. When he picks up the phone and he talks, it's about life and death. It's a serious thing. And when he picks up the phone and talks with Lloyd Austin or Ben Wallace or other counterparts, it's done to try and prevent an escalation. It's done to deconflict. It's not done to play information warfare or spread disinformation. So there had to be a reason why he made this phone call. And we now know what it is. Russian intelligence had gathered specific information about the Ukrainian government preparing a radiological device, a dirty bomb, uh, which they would then deploy in a manner which made it look like Russia had attacked Ukraine. Now, the thing about intelligence is it's not always right. It's not always complete. But when you're a decision maker, a leader, and you receive an intelligence report of this significance, sometimes you have to take action. And Russia took action. What's the result? Well, Ukraine, of course, declares that they're doing nothing of the sort. They've invited investigative bodies from the International Atomic Energy Agency in to investigate. And Ukraine's allies in the West have come out and said, well, this is just Russian exaggeration, Russia uh, fear mongering, Russia actually uh, claiming that Ukraine's doing something, but Russia's really preparing to do it. Nonsense of this nature. But that doesn't matter. The real impact is Russia put a marker on the table. Russia told their Western counterparts that they were concerned about this, and the Western counterparts have acted in a manner which probably means that Ukraine will not be doing anything of this nature if, in fact, they were ever planning to do this. So there's your dirty bomb scare for the week. But that's not the most important thing that's happened this week. The most important thing that's happened this week is a speech given by Russian President Vladimir Putin at, in Sochi, the Valdai. Uh, a, a gathering. Um, <laughs> President Putin is noted for his political rhetoric. Uh, his speech before the Russian Federation Council in uh, April of 2005, uh, where he declared that the fall of the Soviet Union is one of the greatest calamities of the last century. This got the attention of the world. His speech in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference, where he famously took the West to task for their behavior in the world. He chided the American unilateralism, and he spoke of the need for a multilateral world. He's given numerous speeches. His speech on, in, in February announcing the special military operation, his speech announcing partial mobilization, all very important speeches, all speeches that people should listen to. But his presentation today is notable because, in effect, he's saying that American hegemony is over, that the age of the American singularity of the rules-based international order is finished, that the world is in a transition stage, and that Russia will be taking a leading role in participating in this transition. We live in a historical time. We live in a time where things that we once assumed to be the case are no longer the case. And when we look to the future, there's a lot of uncertainty. So there's no better person to turn to at this point in time than somebody who sits in a position of power and authority in Russia. Um, my guest, Franz uh, Klintsevich, he is a member of the uh, Senate, the Russian Senate. He's a seven-year veteran of the Russian Armed Forces. I uh, served in Afghanistan as a paratrooper. Um, but today, he is a member of the uh, Defense and Security Council. Uh, and this is a very high-level body that uh, considers issues related to the topics we're talking about. So uh, first of all, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for coming on today and, and talking with me. Um, if I may, as my, my first question, um, I'm hoping that a lot of Americans are watching this show today. And Americans are ignorant, frankly speaking, about Russia and how Russia operates. If I told Americans that I had a member of the United States Senate's Armed Services Committee on, they'd know exactly what I was talking about. I have you on right now. You're a member of the Defense and Security Committee, 
of the Russian Senate. What do you do? What kind of work do you do? What role do you play in policy formulation? Why are you an important person to talk to? Today, it doesn't matter who I am, but for this program, I act as a person who, for 28 years, has been the head of the civil society of the veterans of Afghanistan, which is called the Russian Association of Afghan Veterans. And believe me, as an officer of airborne forces, as a colonel who served in Afghanistan, as a person who has great, from my perspective, uh, military education to academies, uh, the military institutions, the special uh, vocational training facility, allows me to give a kind of assessment or evaluation of what is going on. You know, I was very surprised at the analysis, a deep analysis and expertise that you provided uh, concerning the situation. From my perspective, it is a very bold analysis based on how the action is happening in the US, including and how sometimes the information is given. So you raised two questions, which I would like to elaborate on from the perspective of the content of uh, the situation. First of all, the deployment in Romania close to Russian Federation borders, the second brigade of 101 uh, airborne forces, the division which, being a young lieutenant, as the preparation was going on, what kind of a benchmark, what kind of a beacon? We always follow the instructions and requirements, have the uh, troops of 101 division performed, and we were very proud to outperform those uh, criteria and requirements in our airborne forces of Russia and the Soviet Union. We had objective comparison, and the leaders always provided this information, understanding that we military people and everything can happen, so we need to look at the best. But unfortunately, like you said, compared with the infantry, brigade or infantry division of battalion of Russia or compared with the Russian airborne forces, today the second brigade compared using, you know, uh, if you look at its uh, equipment and its, you know, any um, its deployment through parachute or airborne forces under today's circumstances is impossible. You know, I personally regard the deployment of this division in Europe as a kind of deterrence act with the possible support of Romanian and Moldavian forces connected it's possible so-called necessary action against Russia. Since what is happening with uh, the 101st Airborne Division is correlated directly with those tasks set by you in the second question connected with provocations. But you need to understand that Ukraine has lost its independence as an independent state, it leaves and it conducts war since the US and NATO countries support through uh, combat forces and through equipment. And today, the president, uh, during the Valdai Club conference, was very explicit about that, that we are trying to save our people, both our troops and Ukrainian, and we are not conducting war as the whole NATO is conducting war against us. We are conducting a special military operation. But what we see, and we have the proven intelligence at the very beginning of the special military operation, before the 24th of February, and today particularly, concerning the negotiations which are conducted by the Ukrainian military forces and President Zelensky with uh, Great Britain 
on creating the uh, small nuclear warhead, which can be used immediately, raises a huge concern among Russian leaders. That's what the, the whole narrative is about. Both the President and the Ministry of Defense, Mr. Shoigu, who has had talks with almost all the Ministers of Defense of all NATO nuclear powers. I'd like you not to make any mistake, the training of so-called nuclear triads, which has happened recently, is not an act of deterrence, this is a preparation and a, a kind of uh, talk in response to how in the Western mass media we see this information that we don't have anything in Russia, that we're just uh, having cartoons, the uh, missiles are out of date, they cannot fly. You know, uh, it would be worst case scenario if the Russian missiles fly, will fly. It's going to be worst case scenario for everyone, as the Russian missiles are not going to be intercepted by anyone. And the consequences of like that shouldn't happen because life will not exist anymore. Therefore, such a talk is taking place. But make no mistake. Today, we are a very peaceful nation and we are very tolerant people. And just behind our Russian tolerance and dignity, we are always deceived. One thing is said and another thing is done. And since today, the collective West has a kind of, uh, 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 you know, kind of crossed Russia out, it's counterproductive and it ha cannot bear any fruit. So Russia today cannot be deprived of any independence, so it cannot be terminated. Yes, we do have many domestic issues, domestic problems created by the sanctions, but everything concerning the economy has been touched upon by the president. Uh, he said that we are deceived of blowing the gas pipe system of Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, and we built this Nord Stream system because we tried to make money on that. That was our main pipeline to the Eastern Western Europe. Now we are blamed for any alleged provocation. If something like that happens, we will be blamed for that. Therefore, today we are trying to warm everyone and based on proven intelligence, on solid intelligence, thanks we have that type of intelligence. We don't have any intention, we don't have any willingness and we don't have any plans to do so. Our planning is connected connected with the nuclear weapons, can be seen in the doctrine. Every person can read our doctrine and can read uh, the circumstances under which our nuclear weapons can be applied. So Russia is not under threat right now. It's the world shouldn't be worried about the use of nuclear weapons by Russia. At that, the same time, we do not agree with the fact that Ukraine and, you know, being a person who is originally Belarusian, I'd like to mention that both Russians and Belarusians and Ukrainians are the single people, are the one people, the Russian people. And in Ukraine, in Ukrainian and in Belarus and Belarusian, they speak two dialects of the Russian language. So this is the problem starting with Mr. Lenin, when the national policy was uh, being, uh, was, was created. And the Lenin national policy was a kind of uh, long-term mine which blowed the Soviet Union and right now it is trying to blow Russia, segregating and uh, making two one people, two, two separate representatives of one people, enemies, in a kind of a civil war. We are absolutely positive that today the war which is being conducted by collective West against Russia by the hands of Ukrainians was created, was imposed by the collective West. And as the president said, we were forced to conduct and start these military operations. In two years' time it would be late in two years period of time we will would be defending Moscow 
and our own cities. Understanding that our independence was under a big, big threat. Today, under the circumstances, the president and the minister of defense, and even the minister, not even the minister of defense, but the minister of foreign affairs, and even the minister of uh, defense, keep on saying that we are ready for the negotiations. But we needn't talk to Ukraine. We need. It is not. It is not uh, an independent country, and Mr. Zelensky is an actor prepared for this particular performance. It has been lost for us. I'd like to say even more. The, his family, which is right now abroad, which is secured by the uh, British special forces, it's kind of a hostage. You know, if he does something wrong, all his family is, has been taken hostage by the Western Special Forces, and so we cannot demonstrate in the information field, we cannot convey this message. And you know, to be honest, I cannot even imagine that this is our talk can be seen in the United States. We would like to convey the truth to the people, that the Russian people are peaceful, and everything which is happening on our border is a defense of our sovereignty, the future of our next generations, of our grandchildren. We would like to live in a peaceful manner with all the people, and if people really like to do that, please listen to Mr. Putin's speech and the answers to the questions by Mr. Putin during the Vavaldai club in Sochi, which you quite deliberately elaborated on and demonstrated some things. They, he has answers to all the questions. I'd like to thank you a lot for giving me this opportunity to give my statement and to convey my message, and I'm ready to take your other questions. Thank you very much for that. Um, you spoke about Ukraine, Belarusians, Russia being one people. You spoke about uh, the special military operation protecting uh, Russia. And we've seen uh, one of the manifestations is the recent absorption of Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Lugansk into Russia, together with Crimea in 2014. And, but if you're speaking about protecting Russia and Russians, what about Odessa? What about Kharkov? What about Nikolaev? Um, are these territories in the Russian people who live there going to be abandoned? Uh, what is their fate? Uh, because, you know, people are looking at the current status of the conflict right now and wondering what's next? What's, what's, what's in store? Is Russia going to protect those citizens or are they going to be left in a in a, in, in a nebulous zone. Thank you for your question. You've raised a very serious question. There is another important component to that. So three tasks uh, being solved by the Russian forces starting their special military operation. The first task is liberation from genocide, which over the eight years of time suffered by the Russian people living in Donetsk and Lugansk uh, People's Republics, which did not agree to live under the fascist regime, and uh, which did not agree to the coup d'etat happened in 2014 and Yanukovych was overtaken, who had to uh, evacuate with the support of the Russian military forces from Ukraine not to not to be as actually assassinated. Nobody talks about that, but this is still true. The second task is demilitarization of Ukraine, demilitarization of Ukraine. And this uh, operation is going to be completed. And the second task, the most important task of the Russian military forces, you know, you know, my uh, uh, passed away dad and granddad could not even imagine that that we are doing denazification of Ukraine, that we are trying in the European 
state who those fascists and Nazis who have power who right now using these fascist mottos and statements who are just destroying the monuments to the Russian military leaders who elaborated Europe and who supported the divisions of SS and divisions of Nazis and the, you know, you see these uh, tattoos, these crazy tattoos in the Ukrainian special authorities with different Nazis signs and the Nazi signs of SS divisions. Can you imagine that? It is not just uh, out of the blue and the collective West and Europe keeps silent about that. Nobody talks about that. So to die, it is not acceptable. We talk about that, it is not acceptable. And we cannot even have this Ukraine being a platform from which it can be a systematic and a military intervention in the territory of the Russian Federation. When it comes to Odessa, Nikolaev, and even Lviv, so this is going to be uh, decided by the people who live in these cities, what and how should be done, where to go and what to do next. You don't have to tell me about um, Nazis. 60 miles from my home in Ellenville, New York, there's a monument to Stepan Bandera. I understand the problem that you face. Uh, I don't understand how my country could have gone to war against Adolf Hitler, allied with the Soviet Union, to defeat the scourge of Nazi ideology, only to allow a statue to be erected on American soil. So I, I sympathize with you completely on this issue. But now we, you, you say the citizens of Lvov are going to make a decision about their future. Um, I, it doesn't take a political scientist or a genius to determine what they'll say. They don't want to be part of Russia. They want, they support the Bandera ideology. Um, not only that, you have people across the border in Poland who think that maybe Western Ukraine belongs to Poland. Um, what, what is Russia going to do about that? I know that uh, supposedly there's 60, 70, 80,000 Russian troops being formed in a group in uh, Belarus. I know there's Belarusian forces that are working with them. I know that Belarusians, uh, Belarus's president um, has said that he will not tolerate Poland going into Western Ukraine. Um, but that's not the problem. The problem is the Nazi ideology that was given birth in Lvov, that is sustained in Lvov. And if you're going to denazify Ukraine, you have to denazify Lvov. How is that going to happen? No, it's a this is, they talk about the future, uh, <laughs> undoubtedly it can be resolved, I'm absolutely positive about that, but the political situation can change and the decisions will be made at different levels. Uh, going to be negotiation between all the actors of this kind of situation. My personal opinion, you know, talking today, uh, just giving my personal opinion, denazification of the whole Ukraine should take place as uh, the demilitarization. You know, it's quite clear when we're talking about demilitarizations, but when it comes to denazification, this is the question of not one day, not, not one year. It will take decades to do so. But believe me, in the area of the Slavonic world, of the Russian world, the fascists and Nazis cannot exist. That's what I can ensure and I can assure you of. And since, according to uh, Pasha mobilizations, we see the people who understand that they are fighting against fascism and they protect uh, our country, we don't have any doubts about that. They keep on saying about that. They are right about that. And we see uh, everywhere. Thank you for that. We take a look at the military situation today. Um, it seems to have stabilized. Uh, it's not like it was a month ago. Um, the partial mobilization is, is ongoing. Um, Russian defenses have solidified. Um, 
Ukrainian attacks seem to be being defeated every time they they make an attempt. Uh, and yet, people talk about a negotiation, a negotiated settlement. There's a perception here in the West that whenever Russia speaks of a negotiation, it's an acknowledgement of weakness, that you're negotiating because your military is incapable of accomplishing the tasks that you've outlined. Is this indeed the case? Is uh, talk of negotiation a sign of Russian weakness, or is there something else at play? No. You know, the talk about negotiations is a talk about the agenda and the participants to talk with Ukraine, which is not an independent state, is very counterproductive. But at the beginning of our talk, I told you, and you need to understand that, that everything connected with Ukraine, with its military components, uh, is not a threat to Russia. Today, over the eight years, the collective West, behind the peaceful narrative they have prepared Ukraine for eight years for the war against Russia, and today, we see kind of a proxy war of the collective West and NATO against Russia. And we need to understand that. We need to admit that you cannot hide this component anywhere. That's why there are so-called tactical decisions on the battlefield line, on the front line. We have 1.2 thousand kilometers of the front line, and the Russian forces, which started their military special operations, are just four to five times uh, lower in number compared with the Ukrainian forces. But we have uh, tens of thousands of the mercenaries from different Western countries, both as military specialists and the representative of the private military companies affiliated with these enforcement and military ministries of NATO countries. Just recently I've read in the West mass media and about the losses by the Western mercenaries, more than 50,000 of dead of foreign mercenaries, representatives of so-called private military companies, big losses in the Ukrainian military forces. And the fact is that the committee of the uh, soldiers' mothers applied to the leaders of Ukraine to get response to those who are lost, 320,000 people. And if we look at the official numbers, you can see that it's over 400,000 of people, destiny of who is unknown. You have 6,000 tanks, more than 6 thousands of different armored vehicles, 4,000 artillery systems and motories, 400 reactive systems, around 400 systems of air defense systems, and more than 3,000 of artillery systems of different type have been already eliminated on the territory of Ukraine. Today, Ukraine doesn't have even the weaponry of ammunition of the Soviet systems which uh, have been terminated. Today, Ukraine will is using HIMARS and M777 with your ammunition against the Russian cities. Today, the 2nd Brigade of 101 Division has deployed in Romania and is getting ready to enter Moldova and Ukraine. You know, I can say this is madness for you, even if uh, this 101 uh, Division without any fire support and with the heavy vehicles is going to enter Ukraine, how is it going to conduct war? They are going to be just suffocated there like small cats. It's not just fighting against just unprepared people. So this situation is not very favorable for them. But I would like to say to you that when we are 
talking about the front line. Today, this kind of an expectation phase. We have created reserves and we are expecting when, including, and first of all, under the leadership of the American commanders. It's not a secret for us, maybe it's secret for you, it's not a classified information to us. It is just under the leadership of American generals and those military specialists of other NATO countries. And the Ukrainians are just uh, the puppets today in every brigade, in every regiment. Uh, there are mercenaries, there is uh, equipment using these special satellites of distance operation and organized by Mr. Musk, Elon Musk, of fast internet by Starlink. We see the management of forces by NATO leaders and of Na Ukrainian forces. We are waging war against. You need to understand, it's not Iraq, it's not Lebanon, it's not Egypt. This is war using the uh, network and NATO-centric, you know, just 268 satellites, American satellites, are working for the purposes of the Ukrainian forces. Can you imagine what we're talking about? So this is a very serious preparation from the US, but I'd like to tell you for sure, the president just recently said that we haven't even started for, in earnest. So, the situation in the future can develop in a negative way, in the worst case scenario. And those uh, military leaders and military commanders who uh, would like to push Ukrainians to use this dirty bomb with further provocation against Russia, where we have all the proven intelligence, we will have very long term circumstances and repercussions for the whole world. Believe me, we will not tolerate that. We will hold everybody accountable for that. That's why we keep on saying that Ukraine, together with the Western representative of NATO countries, is preparing provocation against Russia to demonize Russia and probably to use more serious things. And the fact that the Americans have prepared and are moving the nuclear uh, nuclear B-6112 closer to Russian borders. This is not a very friendly act. Can you notice that in the territory of Cuba and Mexico or any country close to the USA of Venezuela? We are not preparing, we do not deploy our strategic forces and our nuclear weapons over there. And these nuclear weapons that are moving to the borders of Russia are not for the Korean People's Republic where you have great friendship and whom you give just threats. This is all against us, and it is being prepared against us. And that raises just huge concern in our country. If I'm going to be shown to the American TV audience, you know, I would like to mention one more time, we are a very peaceful nation, but the Russians always started the war in our own territory, but completed that war in the territory and area of those states which started war against us, started the history of Russia and of the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire. The Russians do not lose wars. And we have never started this war. We have never started this particular war. We are defending our sovereignty and this message should be conveyed to everyone. Well, thank you very much, and you just conveyed it, so I hope people are listening. Um, when, before this special military operation started, Russia presented two draft treaties, one to NATO, one to the United States, in December of 2021, uh, that spoke of the need for the creation of a new European security framework. Um, someday this conflict in Ukraine is going to end. And let's say it ends with a Russian victory. Russia achieves its goals of denazification, demilitarization, etc. Is Russia willing to re-engage with the West about a new European security framework 
along the same lines that they articulated in December? Or is Russia, emboldened by its victory, going to make the terms even more difficult? Is Russia willing to seek a diplomatic solution with the West to this problem? Russia has always been seeking for diplomatic solutions. Russia has kept on saying that the bad peace is even better than any a good war. And the president during this Valdai Club conference said that we are for the peaceful uh, resolution, we are ready to talk, but we need to consider, you need to consider what Russia is saying. And for a long period of time we are we've been talking about the red lines, but nobody has heard us, nobody has listened to us. Over the period of time, starting uh, Brezhnev rule, starting Brezhnev rule, we have been deceived. Can you imagine that? When we talked about the arms control over the whole period of Time. Being a young lieutenant, when we reduced different strategic weapons number, you know, these weapons should, should be reduced. We reduced these uh, strategic weapons. We tried to talk with the Western country to provide and to ensure the stability and peace. We, I'd like to apologize, but can you remember the period when we talked that the Soviet Union uh, and Russia was, should become a part of NATO, but artificially we were kind of rejected. Primakov said in 1991, when the USSR, USSR collapsed, he said that, I don't remember who it was exactly, but it, should, it might be Primakov, the, the biggest threat is to lose an enemy. We were not adversary to you. Step by step, you started to create an enemy out of us, understanding that you just uh, start your uh, military defense sector, military defense industry, you keep on talking that you can make money on the war happening somewhere else. The Americans and the British specialists prepared Bucha case where the corpse of people were just placed on the, along the streets and uh, Russia was blamed for that and we look at the documents and the journalists said that it was not the case. You know, I remember Syria, these uh, white helmets with those uh, provocations and the, the uh, English specialists were quite proficient in that. They uh, just uh, trained this special uh, forces of Ukraine to prepare this fake news and to uh, start the disinformation campaign against Russia. It's not we who just kill the military hostage. We just uh, give them special treatment. We know that is happening. We do not torture the soldiers of Ukrainian forces. We are not, not trying to deter them. We do not kill our own people who who were in the Russian area, and today we see that the Ukrainian forces entering the former territory under our control just kill people. If we hadn't started the special military operation, the whole population, since they are called separatists, would have been killed in Lugansk and Donetsk. People's Republic. And that would be under the silent agreement and leadership of the Western specialists who are inside Ukraine and who are in all the ministries and agencies of Ukraine, talking particularly about the enforcement agencies, military agencies. That's not who, that's not us who are doing that, that's you who are doing that. But our president was very tolerant about that. But I feel pain about that, and I'm very concerned about that, that this is the whole truth. I have always been a person who can collect, gather, and process and analyze this information. And I'm absolutely responsible for the whole world. What I'm saying, there's no us who proclaim proxy war. You proclaim proxy war against us, and that's the war you're conducting against us. That's why we were forced to start this partial mobilization 
to ensure security and stability of our country in all these four regions. That's what we did in Syria when there was a new uh, terrorist state appearing with the ISIL flag. That's you who created this ISIL so-called state. Even during my Afghan service, it was not the USSR who created Taliban. Your special intelligence, your intelligence created Taliban and Al-Qaeda and ISIL created by your special forces. And they are led by them. It's not a kind of a nuisance or the nonsense of a former officer. The situation we see today and the situation demonstrated by our president during today's speech can be regarded as a kind of um, float. But we are saying that you are playing with fire and we do not light the matches and the powder barrels. But thanks to the God, we have means to defend our country and to protect our state, our independence in our borders. You need to understand that. I'd like to reiterate Russia and the Tsar Russia, Soviet Russia and New Russia has never started war. We were attacked. But all the wars have been completed in the capitals of those states which started war against us. Look at the history, remember the history, and try to think how to convey a message to your politicians that all the work against Russia is of counterproductive nature. Russia is ready for cooperation, to peaceful resolution, and further work. We did not blow. How do we call them? These gas pipelines. That's not us who did that. We did not have anything to do with Skripal's case. We didn't have anything to do with coup d'etat in Ukraine 2014. That was done by the representative of the intelligence special forces of your country. And if people can listen to me and say, you know, maybe it's truth, said by this guy, maybe it was the case, but it doesn't mean anything. That's what your policy is about. You know, such policy against Russia is not appropriate. And our president, during the Valdai club conference in Sochi, was very explicit about that. Thank you very much for that. Um, but I think this has been an invaluable conversation, and I appreciate your time. I have one last question for you. And this is a question that um, I'm, I'm hoping can bring hope. This, the situation that you've outlined um, is very dire, as your president has noted in his, in his uh, presentation at the Valdai uh, gathering. Um, we're playing with fire, and it's it's dangerous situation. But let's just assume for a second that we succeed in getting past this alive, that we don't end up killing each other. You know, I uh, I was part of that disarmament. I was a weapons inspector in the Soviet Union as part of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, and Ronald Reagan, my president at the time, when he signed the INF Treaty, he used the term trust but verify. That was an important part of our task, our verification task. Trust but verify. Here's my question to you. Having said everything you've said, can Russia ever trust the United States again to enter into the kind of treaty-based disarmament that would be necessary to bring the tensions down? Will Russia ever be able to trust America again? You know, when all those Russians, even when we have been deceived a thousand times, but then there is a constructive talk, we always trust. We always trust. We are very ready to trust people, and we will be ready to take any steps to avoid war. We will take all the necessary steps for the peace to be sustained, unlike the US. Russia has always faced these problems. 
What happened in 1941-1945, what happened to us in 1991 with your definite participation and what happened in the mid-1990s in the Chechnya region, what was happening there when the collective West prepared the terrorists. You cannot imagine every week in Moscow in the mid-90s there were uh, terror attacks, uh, just there were people who just were on guard not to, to avoid any explosives in their blocks of flats. That was organized by the Western countries, and we've gone through that. But nevertheless, we are ready to trust, and we will be ready to achieve this peaceful resolution, friendship and trust. Russia has never, under no circumstances, changed its treaties and words. We've never deceived anyone, but when Russia is deceived and when there is a serious threat to Russia, Russia it takes a long time for Russia to start, but we move very fast after that. That's what the Russian saying goes. So this Russian saying should be conveyed to the people. We are a very peaceful nation and would like with the collective West and with the USA to live in peace. But if there is threat to Russia, we will retaliate. And we are capable of any retaliation. We have all the necessary capabilities to retaliate and we are able to do that. Believe me, we are very determined and bold people, but we are ready to trust and we are ready to friendship. Let's have friendship. That's only the way how we live in a peaceful world. If anyone who is trying to make money on the war, we say to them, make your money in a peaceful way. It can be done with Russia. Russia has been developing very intensively, but you cannot make money on war against Russia. On war against Russia, you will lose everything, including business and life. That's what I know for sure. Believe me, as a person uh, attending war uh, in total more than seven years. I believe you. Thank you very much. Uh, you've been a, a very valuable guest. I appreciate your time and your honesty and your answers. This has been uh, Franz. Uh, Plincevich, a uh, senator uh, in the in the Russian uh, Federal Council, uh, unique insight into the Russian point of view. And frankly speaking, at this point in time in the United States and indeed in the collective West, we need to consider the Russian point of view. You may not have to agree with it, but consider it, discuss it, debate it, have a dialogue about it. That's how you empower yourself with knowledge. And remember, knowledge is power. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next week.